So Jim Austin uh, came to us, actually he got, I think, dragged into one of our other lectures uh, by a previous speaker, uh, Karen Marcello from Dorkbot and Survival Research Labs, and he brought in these objects, and, um, and they were tremendously compelling objects, and then I realized that they were things like, you know, whole sets of things, and it looks like just someone, you know, some crazy person's chain ring until he explains to you that, oh, well, this is the piece of metal that it starts with in order to get this very finely crafted thing. And, and there's very few people that, that work in this medium, especially to the degree that Jim does, and uh, we thought it would be really great to share with you all both the process by which he got there and then the process by which he's now doing things in the world. So um, the... You know, we're talking to a fair extent tonight about the Iron Age, uh, and just to put it in context of Long Now, um, you know, many of you have seen this chart, and the idea of Long Now is that we are, um, we're talking about the last 10,000 years and the next 10,000 years, and that we are uh, not at the end of a 10,000-year story, but really in the middle of at least a 20,000-year story of, of modern humanity. And, and the age that we are talking about tonight is really a, a big part of that. And um, you know, as you can see from you know, 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago, this is when the Mesolithic age started, and then the Neolithic uh, around the same time of the first cities. And then there was this really big fluorescing time that happened around 2,500. You can see things like Stonehenge and the pyramids, as well as the Bronze Age really got going then. And then the Iron Age started, uh, you know, there's iron definitely being used long before that and even steel long before that, but around 800 BC. And um, we are still in the Iron Age. Uh, and, you know, we're even still in the Bronze Age. We're still in the Wood Age. Um, these ages don't end. They are continuums. Uh, but there's certainly skills that have been learned and had peak knowledge in Damascus steel, let's say, um, or even some of the things like making anvils, which we'll hear about tonight, which are actually arts that have largely been completely lost to the world and are now done in ways that are inferior to the old way and there's just no real model for them to be done now. And so we're gonna talk about some of those. And uh, you know, some, of the, uh, some of the techniques that we're talking about tonight are, are still used in highly modern manufacturing. I mean, jet planes still have forged elements and mostly now in, in some of the high-tech industries we use forging and we even use it in the clock project, the 10,000 year clock. Um, you can see these uh, stainless ring forgings. These are uh, basically when you want to get, uh, you know, if you were going to try and make a, cir a large circular thing out of stainless steel now, making it all a disc, cutting it out of plate would cost way too much money. So you actually get these ring forgings made, you machine those, and then you, so you get this what's called near net objects made. Um, and uh, so we did that for some of the largest bearings that are in the clock, these uh, whole series of you know, 30 inch bearings uh, that, were, that we built for the clock. And so it's, a, it's both an ancient process and it's an extremely modern process at the same time. And I think the other thing that's important to understand about um, about forging is it's, it's very different than most of the modern processes that we now have. It used to be, uh, you know, for the last kind of 100 years, we've really been using reductive processes, which means you have a milling machine moving through steel um, or metal that's removing from a large block. And so you're doing reductive processes. And now everyone's very excited about additive processes where we're, we're adding layers of plastic or even metal now to create things with 3D printers. And, uh, and that's, that's what that is. But what we're talking about tonight is really what's called effectively a plastic process. Yes. Um, where we start with a lump of a thing and you don't really get to um, change its mass fundamentally. You just get to move its mass around. And so you actually have to, your brain has to think in a very different way to create things with forgings than it does for some of these other processes. And um, it's, you know, I think many of you have heard the old adage, you know, how did you, you know, Michelangelo, how did you carve that, uh, you know, the Pieta out of stone? He's like, well, I, I started with a stone and I removed everything that wasn't the Pieta, right? And so that's, that's one way of thinking about how to create objects. But this way is, is I started with this mass of stone and I pushed it, or clay in a way, it's more like clay, I formed it into that object, but I never got to change its mass fundamentally. So that's what we're gonna talk tonight. And I, I wanna start um, to a certain extent just on your 
um, on how you got here. Um, and uh, can you say a little bit about how you found forging or how it found you? Yes. Um, well, I was raised to be something a little bit above an engineer, which in my family meant I was going to be a scientist. My dad was an engineer. And uh, the pressure in the 60s, 50s, whatever, was to, you know, to get a higher degree. And I uh, started going to school um, to be a chemist. And I kept plugging away at that. Um, somehow nobody noticed, though, that what I really wanted to be was an archaeologist. <laughs> and uh, it, it uh, just basically came back to bite me halfway through my um, PhD work at Berkeley in uh, 1982. I just couldn't do it anymore. I realized I was never going to be a great scientist. Um, and I always wanted to make something with my hands. So uh, I decided um, basically to pursue a, a traditional craft. And about the same time, I got the opportunity to travel to Germany to see if there would be an apprenticeship available to me. And I took the opportunity and somehow it worked. Uh, I ended up there a few months later in, at the end of 1982 as an apprentice in Bavaria. And we have your, your final project, right? Uh, or one of them? Yes. Uh, this would be possibly considered something like a master's piece uh, in, in the 1980s in Germany. Although I never became a master, I wanted to do something in my trade, which was lock making, which would be equivalent to it something like my boss made, and this is what I uh, came up with. It's a lock based on uh, 15th century, mid-15th century German locks, uh, detailed a little bit industrially. And the, isn't there a, there's a history of lock making and forging. Didn't, I mean, forging came out of lock making, or there was some guild association, is that right? Uh, actually, there was a guild division. Huh. <laughs> yeah, it, sort of as was typical in Germany in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, the, the guilds kind of rigidly defined what their sp sphere of influence was. And interestingly enough, a lockmaker was allowed to use a file and a blacksmith was not. <laughs> right. So, and that's, the, and that's a, it's a curious division. It gets back to the thing that I was mentioning before, reductive versus plastic or, mm -hmm. or additive. And, and so a lot of your processes, especially as we get to the Viking axes as well as this, you do a forging to get it very close to what you want. And then you do a lot of very, very careful file work or grinding work to get it to the final thing. But yeah. I mean, you, when you have a chance, you should come up here and look at this maze key. It was the first part they made, the key. And feel the action of this thing. I mean, it is, and each gate that's within the key is stunning and it just hurts my teeth to think someone filed this, this beautifully. <laughs> um, it is. Actually, uh, the, the uh, challenge was to forge the parts then finish them only with files and uh, with the aid of a straight edge uh, vernier caliper and uh, one or two other measuring tools, but nothing else. Uh, and I finally broke down at the end of the process after I'd spent about a year of my free time on it, and I, I turned the rivets on a lathe. <laughs> I, kind <of> always, <laughs> I kind of always regret that now. <laughs> And what would have been the process without turning them on a lid? Forging them closely and then filing it? Yeah, quite possibly. It's, it's not unlikely that they had some setup to file them on a lathe or something. A turning, yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind of hand turning. Yeah. And, the, and you, know, you use traditional methods, not necessarily 100% traditional tools, as we know, things like power hammers are mm -hmm. part of your welding repertoire. Machines, yeah. uh, welding machines and, and, and electric grinders. Um, but uh, what... How did you end up getting into some of these traditional crafts or trying to find ways that, uh, that, that these objects were originally made? What was attractive to you about that? Well, to begin with, the objects themselves were incredibly attractive to me. Um, I, you could see hints of uh, uh, forging processes that were used, that, which were partly mysterious because you know, they sort of self-extinguished the marks. But what you could see was always kind of uh, enticing, like to figure out how they might have done that. And uh, eventually that just became a really driving force for me toward the end of my stay in Germany in 1987, 88. I was simply looking for old rural objects which were made with very uh, simple means but a great deal of skill. And you know things that might be considered a trick unless you simply learned it from the guy who was making them already. 
uh, and trying to figure out, reverse engineer that stuff. So that's, and, that's what a lot of the key rings are about. The, yeah, these key rings that kind of show you the process, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the, the trick. And, and one of those uh, is this one, which um, do you want to talk about the, how, you, how you got to figure out this particular trick? Uh, well, I've always been interested in axes, and um, this is uh, this isn't the axe that I wanted to forge in the in the uh, '80s. I wanted to do a, a goosewing axe, um, but that's a little still a little beyond me right now. But I did get very interested in the Viking Age uh, by my friend Jeff Pringle, who's here, and. Uh, uh, you know, the Vikings are kind of known for axes for various reasons, and um, it's, mostly uh, swinging them at people. <laughs> yeah, yes. like it's, a la <laughs> it's the last thing a lot of people saw. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyways, it, it was also a few things were known, but uh, apparently not very uniformly by people who were interested in axes. One, it was known. You know, it's it's always it's long been known that the axe was welded together to form the eye. It wasn't. There wasn't any uh, form of hole cutting that led to this hole. It was actually forged in a kind of a special sequence of steps and then folded over to form the eye. And then these two laps, p uh, pieces of metal, which come close together, are uh, basically laminated together and forged such that you can't see the joint in most axes. And that, to me, was like, again, it was the great attraction of figuring out how that would happen. And that was not something that was kind of widely known. You had to figure that out by, by looking at old pieces and, and working it out? Well, Jeff helped out a lot on that. Yeah. And uh, it was known to academia, it was known that you know, this was a way of doing it. But academia is like shockingly uncurious about like, how that might actually work. And a lot of people who, a lot of people who taught themselves uh, axe making, let's say, uh, sort of followed the pattern of making a hammer, which in a modern uh, sense means you punch a hole in it. So they, they assumed, especially in the case of some very beautiful axes, of course they put the nicest ones out in the museums, uh, where you can't necessarily tell how they're made, uh, and so there, there wouldn't be evidence of a weld. And a lot of people sort of skipped right over to the, um, the idea that they would be punched. And, I just thought, well, that seems so unlikely for a, a lot of material-specific reason. They didn't really have a chisel that could cut a deep hole in hot, uh, hot metal back then. And, uh, and then when it, uh, the idea of lap welding uh, the eye came up, I just, I just had to try it. You know, I tried about 10 different ways that didn't work very well and finally came up with this method and a series of measurements and steps to produce it. And, so, and when you say welding, we actually have... We have a good video of forge welding. Okay, so yeah, so those guys that were uh, with the big ring, that was, uh, is that one on? No, yes. That was, I, uh, the right, the, we should put on the forge welding one, because mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, often mo when you think of welding now, you think of arc welding by pumping a ton of amperage into, into something and heating it up locally. But what you're talking about is you actually, you put the whole thing, get it very, very hot, yes. and mm -hmm. hammer it together and weld it, uh, yeah. weld yeah, it yeah. that way, right? Yeah, There's, it, it's a kind of mysterious, process, especially to people who know a little bit of smithing, but they don't know how to forge weld, it seems like the, it's, it's the ultimate goal to learn how to do this. And it, it's quite doable. Um, uh, it, it, there's so these guys are, I mean, just, to, so they're building a fire on the area. They're actually bringing the fire to the object yeah, in this large case. Right? The guy hammering in the background, he's way in the background. Yeah, right. the, the fire is where the weld, the weldment is placed. And uh, it's just heaped with coal and simply heat it up slowly and carefully until the entire piece, top and bottom, comes to a welding heat, which you recognize as like looking like a 100-watt light bulb. I mean, it's just so bright you can't really see it. Um, and it, it looks liquid on the surface because any slag that's present is, in fact, liquid, which is, protects the two surfaces that have to come together. And it's basically the metallic you know, surfaces, uh, which are free of, ox, uh, of, uh, of solid oxides due to the liquid coating simply approach each other so closely that the, that the metallic bonds form across the joint. And you've got basically one chunk of metal after that. Quite fascinating because you, you, uh, then you have to kind of plastically deform both parts of the weld into each other 
and finish the weld. It's not, you don't bring two pieces together and run a seam down them. Right. Which would be vastly less strong and uh -huh. they just had no way of even doing localized data. Right, there was no well. such thing. And so uh, it's actually a good segue into this object here, right? This is, uh, this is a, an anvil that was made in a way with this kind of process, right? Yes, yes. This is, um, <clears throat> anvil companies existed in Germany in the Westphalia area and it, it was blessed with iron ore and water power and coal. So, and basically that's, that's what you need to make large things out of iron, which would be things like anvils and anchors, stuff like that. So it, it turns out that anvils, to my surprise, I actually realized in Germany that I had no idea how an anvil was made. So I went to my boss in Germany and said, so how, you know, this is a German anvil, how was it made? And he had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it became clear very shortly that nobody had really taken the time to learn about it. They, they just weren't interested. It wasn't gonna make you any money. So anyways, after continued asking, I finally found somebody who was obsessed by anvils. <laughs> <laughs> He had them in a sump in, in, a, in, a, in a shed in the garden. And they were just sim they were sit sitting in a pit, <laughs> stacked. And he, he knew a lot about it, and uh, he got me in touch with it, the last anvil-making company. They had, in fact, bought all the tools and materials of all the other companies that slowly went out of business in the uh, early 20th century. And basically, uh, the factory was there, the tools were there, uh, the materials were there. There just weren't enough people to still make them. And, uh, but they reconditioned no, the and, But there was like not actually enough people. It wasn't that there was a low number of people, but you, didn't you need like eight people swinging hammers at the same time in order to do it? To make like a big anvil, yeah. yeah. But uh, you could make an anvil with three people. And there was two, so. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it could have been a cover story because they just didn't want to make them anymore. Uh, they probably couldn't profitably do it. Uh, or it could have been, you know, probably true that you needed, um, I don't know what the three guys exactly would do. Two, one guy would have to bring part of the anvil from one fire, the other guy would have to bring the part of the anvil from the other fire, and probably the other guy laid the first uh, uh, sledgehammer blows in, the other guys probably dropped uh, the tongs or whatever and grabbed their, their uh, striking hammers and finished. So, but, and that's how you added each piece. The, the anvil was simply built up from one made chunk and each piece was added to it. And this anvil, which is called the old Bavarian form, was sort of the bugbear. It was the hardest anvil to make. It was the one with the most pieces. There are probably 15 or 16 pieces of metal in this anvil. The most important one was the hard steel face, which generally went from tip to tip. But the horns were all added on, the, the breast was added on, this, the feet were added on, everything was, came separately. Always in each case, a small piece of metal was brought to the, the large piece, both at welding heat, and they were simply hammered together. And uh, beyond that, they were sort of smeared into each other, and sometimes little, little bits they called sausages in Germany, of course, or, <laughs> or, or they were called gluts in English, and they were simply added to fare the curves together. Uh, the, the Germans were, were awfully good at doing this um, and taking everybody else's business away, basically. Because they made them for all the other countries of, of Europe, too. And so, I mean, I think what's interesting is that we often see anvils and we go, oh, it's an anvil. But what's always unclear, I think, is that the an anvil was, a, was an amazing piece of technology, right? It was the thing that you could hit all the other metal against and it didn't move. Um, and it didn't get formed the way the thing that you are, that is red hot, that you're forming. Um, and that it came in, there's hundreds of different styles yeah, yeah, that yeah. you used to be able to order mm -hmm. them. And you, I think there were some shots of uh, the, catalog, the old catalogs uh, of anvils. And each one of them had a history and they were even regionalized, right? There was, yes, like, yeah, there was the one place that made one and another one. And yeah, they, they wanted different shapes. Every, in a region, there was every different trade that needed an anvil. Um, there was every different region all over the, each country. And, um, you know, I mean, a different anvil might have had the hole over here or whatever, but uh, there were a lot of different uh, styles of making them. And these and, anvils, and as well, and you even brought, so you brought a lot of this stuff back from Germany after your tenure there, right? Yeah. That, but, that includes some of the anvils and I think even the stumps that the anvils were yeah, yeah. attached to. Yeah, yeah. There, there just happened to be a saw works above on the top of my street and 
you know, they had a stack of oak uh, tree trunks there, and it was easy to just drop off a couple of anvil bases. And at the time, I was going to ship nine crates anyway, so I just threw them in the crates, and, and they came over with the anvils. And I, the other tool that I think is interesting, I think a lot of people associate forging with, and we've seen some videos of people swinging hammers as well as yourself, but there's, there's another modern version of that that I think is worth talking about. You don't, you don't swing in a, a hammer for every single thing that you form in mm. a forge, right? Uh, no, you use the power hammer. Power sometimes. hammer. Yes. So uh -huh. the, power, the power hammer is where I was going. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not the water-powered hammer of a thousand years ago, but right. yes, the, the uh, electrically powered hammer. Uh, they, they used water power to power hammers that were, could have been driven off line shaft in the 30s. There was a big, obviously there was a big push in the 30s to revamp the industries of a lot of different countries over there. And that's when a lot of things were converted from actual shafts, like in, the, in that Swedish, uh, the Olafors uh, factory. Um, they were converted from actual wooden hammers with big medieval parts on them to the modern, the modern versions of, of hammers that were designed about the beginning of the 20th century. Right, so this is a picture of you operating your power hammer. So a lot of the work that you do is actually you use a foot pedal to, yeah. to it's get not the striking. Cheating. It's not cheating. <laughs> <laughs> to get the striking force against what you're after. But you, yeah, you're kind right. of feathering that and that becomes yeah, the yeah. art as well. A good hammer is highly controllable. You could, you know, you could forge down three inch square stock maybe and then, and then turn around and forge out something quarter inch square on the same hammer. So it had the sensitivity for that. I think we have a video of a water hammer being operated in someone yeah, yeah. by in an extremely unlikely, totally white suit. Um, <laughs> That's Sebastian. I'm going to tell him you. <laughs> like, you're working in a forge in a white outfit. Yeah. So this is this is the water hammer. Yeah. Give you an idea of the old way of cheating. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, and so, so you mentioned a little bit about how you got to to Viking things. Was was there just something about the the genre, or was there? How did you end up in the Viking world? Well, it, it's a kind of attractive uh, um, level of technology to work at. It, the the tools are small, so if you're going to teach people how to do this work, they they don't have to find a 400 pound anvil to do it with. They could do it on a little tiny anvil because. Basically, that's what they used back then. The selection of tools was, it was basic. It wasn't highly sophisticated. So you don't, you don't have to have a giant tool selection. And, uh, and yet the skill was, the skill was there. And it, so it, it kind of uh, throws the emphasis on the skills. And I, I just find it a useful arena to teach and learn in. And the, we've talked a little bit about both iron and steel. Can you? I, I think, I'm not sure that everybody understands the difference in why you would want to make something out of one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's a, there's a special step also in the axe making that, um, that maybe this piece kind of exemplifies. Well, this axe has been brought to the stage where a steel bit, that's a high carbon bit, has been placed in the front of the axe. And the back of the axe is made out of uh, mild steel, which in my case is a proxy for bloomery iron, and that would have been a very low carbon, easy to forge metal. Uh, it was the cheapest form of iron, but I, you know, that said, iron was a very expensive commodity back then. It had to be made by, uh, you know, backbreaking work, you know, charcoal making, ore digging, stack building. It was, and then when the iron that you got looked like lava rocks, basically. So those needed to be uh, put through a lot of additional steps to get anything usable. Then you started making your axe. Uh, so, and so iron is is the is is what you smelt out of the earth basically. Yes, uh, and then steel is steel would go through additional refinement. You, you might be able to smelt it directly, um, but you might also uh, take a more sure route to uh, making steel by taking some of your iron and maybe making it into strips and then packing those in charcoal and heating them up to let's say yellow heat for six hours or something like that, in which case the carbon simply diffuses, it directly diffuses into the iron and ups the carbon content to maybe 0.8 or 1% carbon. Uh, you end up with something that's got the potential to be a really fine steel. At that point though, it's just, it's like cookie dough. It doesn't have any good consistency. 
It takes a lot of refinement to get a good uh, blade steel or edge steel out of that or something to put on your hammer to uh, take the impact. Um, <clears throat> so what you've done is you've taken already expensive iron, you've decimated it about 30% of its weight maybe, making it into steel, and then you have something that's much harder to work with. So, right. But it, it's good for blades. It's and good for the, the blade, but right. it would be a lot uh, more expensive and a lot harder to form into any more right. of the more complex shape. And so they would not use it for everything. They would just use it for the sharp bits. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, that, and you see that in the ancient artifacts as well, that kind of that line. Uh, you know, as some, some of the better pieces were probably made this way. Uh, the problem with artifacts is you don't know how much it was used up, you know, reground or whatever. So you don't always know what you're looking at. There's the, the actual placement of steel or even the use of steel is, uh, is a little harder to track down than um, it, it would be in you know, 19th century work. Right. Yeah, but yeah, in, in, a, in a good piece, you'd, you'd see the steel added to the front, sometimes to the side, sometimes to the middle. Huh. You, know, you use, I assume you use commodity materials at this point, yes. but how does this kind of compare to some of the things that they would have had? Um, and so the Viking era, as we're talking about kind of 800 AD, uh, right, so 800 mm, to 1,000 yeah. kind of time the, yeah, yeah. So, when they were making there. their best stuff? Yeah, yeah, of course, the guys just before they were called Vikings were making you know, roughly similar stuff. And they, Viking forms continued and to the Middle Ages, slowly changed. Uh, the material didn't really change. I mean, the bloomery iron was the, uh, the rule, basically, back then. It was very, like I say, very low carbon, very soft, because it, it, uh, it wasn't solid steel. It had slag interspersed throughout the throughout the structure of iron, so it tended to move easily. Um, and uh, it would have been easier to weld together, probably. So what I use is harder to forge. It's harder to weld together to a certain degree, but it's dead cheap. And uh, if you're going to teach something to students, then you, you want to make a doable task out of all of this stuff. So I, I teach in something that you can buy. Um, and uh, and I use techniques that enable it to, to uh, weld together well so that, that that doesn't become a hurdle. A lot of people are a bit apt to think that you just can't weld modern steel together. And just like I wanted to show people that these hammers aren't split, I do want to show people this is all doable technology. And so that's actually a great segue. I wanted to talk a bit about now how you're conveying this to, to the world now that you've mm -hmm. kind of figured out a lot of these, these things. Um, so you teach classes in your own shop or mm -hmm. at other places? Or? Yep, yep. Um, my Danish friend thought up the name Rot Academy. These cards are out there. <laughs> Morton, great guy. And so that's mostly at your shop? <clears throat> yes, uh, th there's, no other, there's no other location. I teach at the Crucible from time to time. Uh, they, they've got good stuff going on down there too. And, but I wanted to have complete control of the the tooling and the fires and, um, um, you know, set the space up the way I wanted to do it. So the obvi obvious thing to do is to devote part of my shop to that purpose. So I have uh, six teaching stations, basically. And this is over in Oakland? In Oakland, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, uh, and part of that is, is this process that I'm holding up these two objects of, and um, both the kind of how you've brought these objects to these kind of stop motion states and mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's worth pointing out the difficulty of what he has done here. They, you know, this means that for, ev for doing the whole progression of, let's say, the axe making, he had to make that axe effectively 20 times um, or up to that stage 20 times in order to, to get to this thing. So I, I highly encourage you uh, uh, in the end here is to really look at these things. They're, they're pretty amazing. And, and then you've gone to another stage with this much lighter version yes. um, by 3D scanning it and then um, putting these objects up so that people can look at the, the 3D objects as well as 3D printing them mm -hmm. um, as, a, as another way of conveying them. And, that's, and it's starting to get to where we are here with the Manual for Civilization. So the, the book, uh, the library shelves here, the idea is that this would hopefully be the 3,000 books you would most want to restart civilization. And um, certainly one of the, the types of things we want are uh, things like uh, the, how you do forging. And one of the very first things we brought in here were the Gingery series of books. 
that start with how to build a forge. Mm -hmm. And then once you build a forge, you build all these other things. But fundamentally, the very first thing you need to make before you make any other technology is the forge itself and then those first tools. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I think, uh, one of our attractions to this process is, um, is that it is, it's, it's the technology by which all other technologies are bootstrapped. Um, and so if you learn this one, you then can use it to make the tools that make the tools that make the tools. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you do make some of your own tools. We, um, you know, things like hammers, and I was struck by how many different types of hammers you have. No, um, this is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk a little bit about making your own tools to make, to then make your objects? Well, it's, uh, it's something, if you go into smithing, I, I by no means recommend doing that. But <laughs> if you go into smithing, you're going to have to make a lot of tools because there's not a lot available. And um, in some tools, it's crucial that it be made to your exact specification. Uh, like a tong, tongs, uh, if they don't fit your work very, very well, uh, don't enable you to hold on to your work. If you can't control your iron, you can't forge it. So in some cases, you're simply going to have to make your own tongs. Making hammers is somewhat the same, although it's, it's also a matter of just pride sometimes in using your own wares. Um, there's always special bending tools or whatever. There, there's hundreds and hundreds of tools that you might end up making if you smith for 10 or 20 years. And, and the tongs are really interesting to me. In, in machining, one of the things that we often do is make what are called soft jaws, where mm -hmm. you machine the negative shape Mm -hmm, of the thing, mm -hmm. of the complex shape that you then want to hold in order to do the reductive process of machining further on it. Mm -hmm. Like when you flip over your complicated machining thing and now mm -hmm. you have to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. So one of the most difficult things in machining is, is holding on to things. And I, I think it's an interesting parallel that, um, that in forging you end up making all these specialized tongs just mm -hmm. to solve one problem. And, so, and this, this is kind of a different way of solving the tong problem, That right? is cheating, yes. Yes, yeah. this is, well, it's, it's used, so you did modern TIG welding, right? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, TIG welding where you, you basically, you welded the, the tong handle You're really onto one. you drag me through. Oh, no, 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 I think <laughs> no. this is, this is part of the yeah. deal, right? Yeah. So, but one of the things you could have done, like probably what they did is they built a, a ridiculous special tong for every stage of this process, right? I don't, I don't think, you can do most of the work on the back if you can simply grab the thickness on the front. Right. And it could be that they use a longer bar, although the, the bar transmits heat and does become a problem. But yeah, they probably just, the, the, in Sweden, the guy who forged an axe for me simply had one tong for the front, and then he had a tong for the back. So it's, you can get by with, with uh, if you make a bunch of similar axes with maybe just a couple of tongs. And yeah, actually we should talk a little bit about that. You just went, you just went on a whirlwind tour of Scandinavia yes. um, to meet some of all some of the people that are there. Um, yes. And you have kind of supported what you do largely through doing education here. Um, there's obviously no state support for uh, Viking axe um, foraging in California, yeah. but you went to the place where that is different, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there. Uh, okay, so what I did in April, I went to Norway. I spent about three weeks there, and I spent about a week in Sweden uh, with the express purpose of, A, teaching axe make, Viking axe making in Norway. Ha -ha. <laughs> Which worked. It worked. <laughs> and I went to learn from four people who I met through Facebook. And, and, uh, and two of them turned out to be gold mines of information, and the other two guys were great to hang out with and learn with too. I mean, I learned something from everybody. One guy in particular, Matthias, was a total gold mine and really fun to hang out with. Um, and this was one of the yeah, things is, they gave you, is, right? Yeah, this is an axe that Matthias made for, for, oh, I ended up buying for it, although I've not paid for it yet. But <laughs> I keep asking him to send me a, a PayPal invoice. But anyways, he, uh, he made this axe. He makes axes along these lines. He makes kind of whatever he wants. He, he, uh, he lives in an area, uh, western Sweden, that's very old-fashioned in a way. Um, they, and there's just tons of antiques and stuff around there. I mean, there's like really old stuff um, that you can like find at the junkyard. Farmers will give it to you or you get it at the flea market, whatever. In, in other words, there's a, there's a lot of old stock that you can learn from over there. And that's what he does. He, he gets this old stuff. Uh, 
a lot of these techniques have been to a certain extent maintained and even taught at, at certain schools. So, and, and then uh, once you have the basics down, you can look at some of the, the traces in the old pieces and then what he's doing is he's re, uh, recreating uh, some of these axes. And the, the call for the axes is mostly by people who hew, uh, hew logs for building houses. And those, those are the guys who have the money to buy axes and get them made just exactly the way they want. And so, and that's actually an important distinction. I think we all um, are, are thinking of the Viking TV show where the only um, uh, axes we see are being wielded mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other bad Vikings or the mm -hmm. English. But um, mm -hmm. the, one of the major uses of axes is really as a building tool. Yeah, right? I mean, that's probably 99% of the axes were used on the farm to do farm chores or build a you know a new outhouse or something whatever whatever they needed, uh, they had a kind kind of regional um, specific ways of hewing and joining timber and building structures out of it. And there's still people doing that now, amazingly, yeah. right? And so yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I don't think too many new buildings are built that way, but uh, buildings that have rotted uh, timber on them, or they sometimes I guess lift it and uh, make a duplicate log and slip it in and. Yeah, especially in the sills and the foundations, um, you know, some of this stuff rots. But like I say, there's there's houses standing there that, that have been there for 500 years. They don't look like they need that much repair. Um, and so it, it looks like a good investment, you know, to keep. If you do need to do the work, do it, you know, because it'll, it'll be there for centuries. And uh, so those guys, the guys who have the, uh, the contracts to do this restoration work, um, in a lot of cases, they'll have these sweet axes, like this old axe maybe that works so well, but they know if they use it, they're going to use it up. So they, they in, a lot of, in many cases, they'll pay a guy to make the axe right, you know, and, and reproduce it. And the amazing thing to me in watching Matthias work is he, he'll make a few measurements on an old axe, go cut off a piece of steel, and he'll, his, like his first one, he, it's not the only one he's made, but without uh, looking at any, any intermediate stages or whatever, he was able to knock that ax out, which almost just laid over the one he was copying. And the, um, uh, we're also gonna open this up to, to questions soon, and you're gonna be around to, and I, and I hope walk around to some of these stations where, mm -hmm. uh, where you can explain some of these objects in more detail, but where, what is your what is your kind of hope with where where to go with some of this next? Is it really just to convey it to the to another generation, or is there well, who's your who's your apprentice? My apprentice is the world. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no um, oh, I I uh, I kind of considered the way uh, uh, blacksmithing and you know, most most trades have been um, handed down or across or whatever over, you know, thousands of years. And basically, you know, it, there has been the master or journeyman apprentice system where one person teaches a few other in his life and they, you know, they continue that work. And then, you know, as things move along in the industrial era, uh, factories wanted to make sure that there were standards for production. So they might keep mid-stage pieces around and have drawings and, and specifications for their work. Um, and uh, industrial economy n might need people who simply go to school and learn this stuff. But still, it's going to generally amount to one teacher and a dozen students or something like that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's getting the word out uh, in maybe more effective way. But uh, I have kind of realized that the best way to, to do maybe a lot of this would be to put the knowledge online. And I thought maybe the best way to do it would be to forge things in stages to make the plastic flow of the material obvious because it is quite obvious if you can compare two pieces that have only had 15 minutes of work done between them, you can see what was done. Uh, if you have only the finished piece, it's nearly impossible to tell how it's done. You can say in theory, oh yeah, that's an asymmetric wrap, but to do it is, is a, a extreme amount of work to reproduce a piece. And yet if somebody does it, if they go to the uh, work of making stages, then they can go and show people these pieces and it, uh, a moderately experienced Smith could suddenly, I think, 
make an ax, you know, maybe by a second or third try. Uh, but it also occurred to me in doing that that I was carrying a box of 40 pounds of <laughs> unique pieces, which if I had simply lost one would be a total pain in the ass. I'd have to make it, I'd have to make it over again. You know, of course, I have the left. I should be able to do it, right? Because I have the, the previous pieces. But it would just be a terrific pain in the ass. <laughs> and, uh, and there's no reason for it to, uh, to be that dire. So I just thought, well, what if we just start scanning this stuff? The, the, uh, the information conveyed by any stage is simply its shape. So the easiest uh, thing to, to uh, get a 3D scan of would be you know, this chunk of iron. It's flat black, it's relatively small, and you know, it represents a very specific stage that would be nice to remember for a long time. Um, so uh, basically a friend of mine at our, one of our California Blacksmith Oktoberfest last year had, a, had a, some sort of scanning software and was using a digital camera to make uh, 3D scans of people. <laughs> and stuff, and I said, well, could you do a few of these for me, Whitney Potter? So he, he did three pieces for me and sent me the, uh, the 3D prints. I thought, this is perfect. It's like, A, it could be downloaded from online. It weighs like two ounces, not two pounds. And it's, not, it's no longer unique. Um, it could be printed out anywhere in the world, and uh, it could represent a process extremely well, maybe better than anything that, uh, you know, not, you know, maybe 1% worse than having the actual steel pieces, but, you know, still, the, the fact that it could be uh, downloaded a million times, you know, is, it's kind of awesome, so. And are, uh, do the Facebook nerd friends in Scandinavia, are they, uh, of the, the forging nerds, I mean, are they, are, are they using some of these objects? Uh, well, no. <laughs> Not yet. As, as a matter of fact, they don't. I showed them this as like, ooh, plastic. You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you don't get it. You don't get it. So we need the, the next generation. The academics are kind of like not so interested in smithing, and the smiths are not quite you know, making the connection, or they don't really necessarily know where to get a scan done. But here, you know, in, in you know, virtually in Silicon Valley, this would be the easiest thing to get done. And it seems like... Um, you know, if somebody's willing to collect the knowledge and make the um, make the sequence, that it would be relatively easy to to put out there. Great. So we'll open it up for questions. We'll also just be around uh, for quite a bit this evening, and then we're gonna drink the <clears throat> stuff that Jim didn't make. Uh, we have. I Chase. found it. I found yes, it. we're gonna be all prepared. Um, okay. Yeah, and it's you... 120 proof, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, not very well. I, I, it's the question uh, is on it's, samurai swords. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I have not delved into that really much at all. I have a little bit of literature which I hope to read someday, but you know, I, I think that is probably some of the best work that's, that's um, ever been done in traditional blades, but it's not really what speaks to me um, in terms of what I'll go out in the shop and do. Uh, it seems beyond me. And uh, I, I am very attracted to the form change and, you know, the, the plastic development of these types of things because it's a forging challenge uh, straight out. Whereas the sword development is more just a plain like skill. It's yeah, tedious they're just problem. so over the top, like complex and and uh, finely controlled. And um, in the end, it's you can't use it for a lot. Um, and I, you know, I, I sort of like the connection to uh, to, the, to the woodwork. I, I'm finding more and more interest personally in the woodwork that's done with these things too, and getting in touch with. Uh, hewers who, who, who make timber frame houses and things. Um, you mentioned your interest in archaeology, mm -hmm. anthropology, mm -hmm. and as I'm watching all this, it occurs to me that it's um, a very, very sophisticated process for what was essentially um, Dark Ages technology. And I was mm -hmm. How do you feel about the Vikings and what they can do? 
amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the first thing that strikes me about them is that they really got around. <laughs> and and that, that in itself is just really interesting to me, that they were so expansive and so curious and uh, wanted to trade and other things. Other things, know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, as soon as they were able to, you know, they apparently just burst out of Scandinavia in these beautiful boats and went all over the place. Uh, and basically it was, it's all due to their, their, their skills with woodworking. And you know, that was sort of catalyzed by their knowledge of how to make great axes and tools. And they're, it, they must have been inventive and adaptive you know, to, to come up with a lot of the stuff that they did. I mean, some of it might be based on Roman, fragmentary Roman knowledge. And, so, and you actually worked a little bit or went to a site where they're recreating some of these old Boats. Boats. Yeah, yeah. There. They're building a replica of a hundred foot long, probably some raiding. Well, it might be a trade boat or something. I, I'm not quite sure. Gokstad ship. And they're doing it straight up original. They're, they're getting uh, oak logs from Denmark, I believe, and they're simply splitting them. They, it doesn't take a lot of tooling to split an immense log. If the grains, you know, if it's been chosen for its straight grain for shipbuilding, then basically they make a few cuts in the front with an ax and then they get little wedges in there and they just start driving the wedges in and it start pops the, the end of the log apart and then they start driving them in the length and all of a sudden the log just pops in two pieces. I mean, that's an extreme skill, you know, so that it doesn't go off or twist, which will cause you a lot of lumber loss. Yeah, one of my favorite stories about the kind of one of those great long-term thinking stories that uh, kind of along the lines of the oak beams of Oxford story that we tell often is actually um, a vastly more documented story um, that is from the um, the Norwegian Navy, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, just you know in the last twenty years the Norwegian the, the the Royal Forester sent a note to the Norwegian Navy saying, "We have the masts that you planted." 200 years ago <laughs> yeah. for your for your ship so that you know yeah. they, they had to plant them 200 years before they needed them of course and so they uh, in the 1800s they planted masks for the navy that they clearly <laughs> yeah. were going to need yeah. in the year 2000 uh, so uh, uh, other questions in the back you mentioned that um, the skills were often defined by the tools that they were and weren't allowed to use to make the file mm -hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> so my point is, is that, like, I'm just trying to understand, like, what, how do you define the rules of, like, what are the, what are the tools or processes that are, for yourself personally, uh -huh. that, like, what are the things that make it satisfying versus outside the realm of, of this art? Um, I would That's a good question. So, yeah, uh, so where, where do you draw the line between traditional, non-traditional, and uh, what, what aids the process? Well... My, generally, my goal is to end up with a finished artifact that reproduces the technical steps that the originals probably used. So uh, the fact that I'm welding uh, a, a handle onto here, is, it doesn't end up in the finished piece. Um, it, it's a bit of a cheat, but it gives me extreme control over the piece. Uh, and yet, it's, it's uh, you know, a bit of work that I have to do every single time that, yes, I should make the tongs. Every smith should make those tongs, you know, that you just keep welding a handle onto it for. But um, it's not as central to the finished. It's not central to the finished piece, so I allow myself that. And yet I do want to, I totally want to forge weld the joints. You know, that's an absolute requirement. I think he also drives a modern car to his shop every day. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, in the front. Um, so my question is, so making these kind of objects is obviously aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. and it's amazing that you're using the modern technology of 3D scanning to move it forward so that more people can learn this skill. But what is the connection in your mind to the past? What's your intention? Is this about discovery, about archaeology, like hands-on archaeology about the Viking era, or is this more about like artisan craftsmanship in the 21st century to you? What is the, what's the sort of point? Uh, uh, I guess I'm are you, always... Are you about the history or are you uh, about the future? Uh, <laughs> or, the, or the present? Uh, I, I like to have a great time in my shop uh, investigating possibilities that... Uh, uh, that might have you know, possible techniques that might have been used in the past to get stuff done. Whenever possible, I will gladly have somebody just tell me how to do it. 
And then I'll, I'll do that. You know, I, I enjoy simply doing things the way they were done. Like when I was a kid, I was like fascinated by Colonial Williamsburg because they're like hardcore about just doing everything the old way there. I'm not quite that hardcore. If I can, A, I don't want to dress up. <laughs> and, uh, B, you know, I, I, I do want to get it done and go on to the next thing. I, I don't want it to be a um, hierarchical thing where I have to go learn everything from some guy. You know, it's like I want to work through stuff and get a basic familiarity with the limitations and the discipline of the material without, you know, taking twice as long to do it. And, you know, part of the reason is I want to represent that sense of this is doable to other people. You know, I, I'm trying to open the doors and make it accessible. And it, it, then you can, also, you can always regress the technique. You could get the clothes, you can, <laughs> you can sit on the ground with your, an, you know, with your little anvil, and you can make this. And once you know how to do the axe, the other part would be sort of, in a way, easier. You know, the, the clothes and stuff. The dressing up. Yeah. <laughs> in the front row. How much would a tiny anvil cost? <laughs> how much does a tiny anvil cost? A tiny anvil, about $100. Yeah. And modern anvils are just cast objects now. They're not uh, forged. Typically, yeah. No, nobody's forging them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So you're gonna go, you want to go on eBay and find one from at least 100 years ago. <laughs> and don't spend yeah, any more yeah. than $100. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested in, in how workspaces make people productive, and I was wondering uh, if you derived inspiration from people in Germany, or where, what, how do you notice the, your workspace specifically, you know, how tools are, how far apart tools are from each other, and how think high things are off the ground for ergonomics mm. and that. Right, so a question on how to set up your space, and I was actually struck when we were at your space that you know you have it set up obviously so you can get the hot metal to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing pretty much by pivoting in nearly just a few steps right right well that's a really interesting point because when i went to learn in germany i was so shocked by the disorganization and the mess <laughs> of the shop that i worked in that i spent about a week i i think i think they told me i spent 2 weeks just cleaning it up i wouldn't even listen to what they wanted me to do i just cleaned up <laughs> Uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other is, uh, if you look at old uh, like illustrations of the trades in the 16th century, a worker was depicted sitting down, not standing. Uh, maybe the smiths, you know, who did big work were, were um, you know, they obviously had to stand and move around. But like the, the sort of white collar work back then, you know, lock making, those guys sat down and they had nice, they had sat in front of a window and they had all their tools there. So. You know, there, there's always an impetus to have your workspace set up exactly for the job. Uh, they might have been more specialized then and not needed as many spaces and tools as I do now to try to do different things. But um, it's just kind of all over the map over there. Uh, if you're a, a general jobber, you know, you have a lot of different tools just because you don't know what's going to walk in the door. And you sort of make an ad hoc workspace, maybe. Um, and if you're more specialized than, you know, like a machinist, maybe, you know, you just, everything's laid out. Uh, back in those days, they, I think they worked in the, in very dark conditions. Matthias, the, the Swedish guy, uh, had a little traditional smithy. And there was like, there was a flap in the roof, which let a shaft of rain come in or whatever, <laughs> and a little door. And other than that, it was like pretty darn dark in there. There was a light of the fire. And I found that's kind of atrocious conditions to work in, but it's very traditional. <laughs> yeah, I have to um, say your shop is one of the nicer shops I've ever been in, certainly one that involves forging. Yeah. So, uh, so last question. Actually, two questions. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I'm having a hard time understanding the innovation of this lap style uh, for the handle versus punching a hole. So why don't you just kind of elaborate a little bit on what what that innovation is and what the advantages are. And then my second question is, is what, are there still innovations to be had in this really ancient uh, art form of, of blacksmithing? Um, well, to the first point, uh, the, the way that they formed the material avoided stretching, like it avoided uh, stretching the material. It compressed it to get all the shape change done. And that it 
can be a big advantage if you're not too sure about the quality of your material or if it has a flaw in it, which probably wouldn't have been uncommon back then. So they were able to hammer it in different directions and squeeze it basically into a longer shape with special features. The only stretch that occurs is when they fold it, the outer, outer surface stretches, but it's pretty thin and pretty mild uh, step there. And then, then again, they're, they're forging it back together and compressing it. So it's, it's a, a, a method that is sort of designed to deal with uh, fibrous material that might otherwise want to fray a little bit. And uh, if you drive a hole through a block, you're stretching everything around the hole and you might just break a seam in the, in the, in the piece you're trying to, to form. And the other thing is, they, they, I really doubt that they had a, a steel back then that they could simply keep hammering into a hot piece of iron and without the end of the tool simply you know, heating up and just bending or riveting into the hole. So uh, you know, they, they were doing pretty deep, they would have had to do very deep cuts to get the shapes that they did. Um, and the second and the question. second question was yeah, and it's a great one to end on, which is um, are there are there still innovations to be had in forging? <sighs> I don't know we'll ever know all that they knew, so I, I can't say we, whether we can innovate beyond what they've done uh, in in technical traditional stuff. Um, I think you know with all of the hundreds of thousands of smiths that have existed for several thousand years it would it would be a hard to ever you know figure out uh, if somebody hadn't done what you were proposing to do and uh, that, I, that's about all I could say about that I mean it's kind of like bicycles every time someone thinks they've invented something you can pull yeah. out the old book and go you yeah. know what actually that got invented 100 years ago yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they were under a lot more competitive pressure back then, you know, to yeah. uh, do it. Well, I think it's important fun. to remember that that's at one point, like making this kind of object was the highest technology of its day. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and these were the, you know, these were the people making the spaceships of their time, right? Mm -hmm. They were the rocket scientists. Um, and so it was, uh, it, there's, it was, at one point, this was always the highest technology. Yeah. So thank you, Jim for sharing with Thank us you. tonight. Thank you very much.